Hello LVC and happy new year. Happy 2021. Can you believe that we're here? I heard someone a few weeks ago say this hilarious thing where they said a couple weeks ago, they said it felt like tomorrow was going to be the fifth anniversary of 2020. Last year felt like a long, difficult year. It was a long, difficult year, but here we are in 2021. I laughed out loud when I saw the Christmas card from a friend where they said, may your 2021 be dot, 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 better. And I loved that. I cracked up because it's so true. On one level, we are just hoping and trusting that at least 2021 will be better. 2020 was an incredibly hard year. And so look, we are entering into another pandemic year. There's still a lot of uncertainty. But yet I think we have a lot of hope. In one sense, there's something arbitrary about how we turn over a new leaf, as it were, when we enter a new calendar year. But there's something really helpful about that. There's something healthy to say, okay, here we are in a new year. How are we going to approach this year? So I think we come into this year with a lot of sobriety, this soberness to say, okay, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Church, we don't know yet when we're going to meet physically. Just by the way, we are going to target Easter Sunday, the 4th of April, as our first Sunday back. Now, at this point, the tentative plan is for it to be a one-off gathering at the pool at McKinney School, where then we just see how it goes and we take a look and see what's happening on the ground. So starting this month, as kids go back to school, church, we're going to be keeping a close eye on how this virus is going. We are all hopeful for the vaccines, of course. We don't know when it will come to Kenya. There are reports of the government purchasing millions of vaccines. So we're gonna keep praying for that and trusting that as soon as possible, we can be back together. But for the time being, we're gonna keep coming to you with these videos. We're grateful for the team that we have that's putting these all together. So I wanna encourage you, church, to be just digging in, watching these videos, hearing the word. This is the one thing in addition to the, the children's videos that our kids get to watch that unifies us as a church as we sit under the word, as we hear from God, as we step out and act. So church this year, I wanna challenge us and encourage us as a church to go after God in prayer. As we face another year in the pandemic, whatever that's gonna look like, I'm calling us, as an elder team, we are calling you to a month focused on corporate prayer. So we're entering into a series today on prayer and specifically on what it means to pray together as a family. So there are going to be a number of announcements coming to you about what that's going to look like. Uh, Lord willing, later this month, a prayer seminar, a half day on a Saturday where you can experientially learn more about prayer. But church, I want to see us go after God in prayer this year, to go after the presence of the Lord, to say, Lord, we need you. Church, part of the reality of that that I want to put before us today as we start this year is that I think we are not yet a truly praying church. Yes, we have people who pray individually. We have prayer warriors in our church. We have small groups of people that get together to pray. We have home groups that pray well together. But in that larger corporate sense, the family gathering, I think we're not yet a praying church. Right now in our biweekly prayer meeting, we have about 2% attendance. In fact, it's actually gone down during the pandemic. So whereas before we'd have about seven to 10 people who'd show up at McKinney at 9 a.m., virtually we've had about five people, about 2% of the adults who are part of our church, call LVC their home church. And so we want to put before you this month the call through the word as we touch upon what it means to be a body, a family that prays together. Call us to really dig in and seek the Lord's face in this new year. Well, one of the passages that I think helps us do that is in Acts chapter 4. So this is the early church. It's as the church is a baby church after Christ has ascended to the Father. The Spirit has been poured out and we come to Acts chapter 4 
So let's hear the word red this morning. Good morning, LVC. The reading for today comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported that all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate made, met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of the Lord, word of God boldly. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Ray. Well, one of the realities around the lack of prayer in a church, of not yet being a truly praying church, there's a couple ways that this shows up. One is that we can have good intentions. We, we know that prayer is important. We know that even praying with other people is important, but it can be hard. Because as D.A. Carson says, this pastor theologian, that if we don't plan to pray, we're not going to pray. We don't pray because we don't plan and to pray. Another way that this shows up is that we have this unspoken belief that prayer isn't important. Now, we, we may know in our head and even in our heart, we, we know that prayer is important. But when it really comes down to living it out and acting it out, we may live as if we say, ah, what's the difference? Does it really make that much of a difference? Well, then another way it shows up is that there's a lack of understanding about what prayer is. And so, like it's common, if we have this view that praying to God is like a genie in a bottle, that if we just say the right words, that God will do what we want, that we just come to Him with what, with our, what our needs are, if we just say the right words, that somehow that'll activate something in God. Well, I think the book of Acts is going to help us see a bit more about what prayer actually is. But then the final way in which we can have these challenges to being a praying church is that we can be really focused on personal prayer. We may have a lot of people who are great in their devotions with the Lord, but when it comes to corporate prayer, to gathering as a body and praying with brothers and sisters, that is more of a challenge. And so one of the first things that we see from this passage in Acts is that they pray together in the face of trials. That's the first insight that I want you to see. So look at verse 24. It says, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. It was an automatic response. It was just automatic for them as a people of God. When a need arose, they prayed. That was their immediate response. In fact, that's the pattern throughout the book of Acts. In chapter 1, when they have to replace Judas, what do they do? They pray together. In Acts chapter 6, they're facing an injustice in the community. What do they do? They pray together. And then in Acts chapter 13, the church in Antioch wants to send out Barnabas and Saul on a missionary journey. So what do they do? They pray together. This is a theme throughout the book of Acts. They pray, they pray, they pray, and they do it as a body. And church, we've actually seen this done beautifully at times in our church family. And my hope and prayer is that if we, as we experience these things, as we get a taste, that it will just compel us even more 
to go after God's presence together and seek his face as a church. So shortly after the pandemic, within the first couple months, we had this situation again with little baby Enoch Tweed, who for the second time in his life faced a serious surgery. And so as a church, we rallied together. I don't even remember who called for this prayer meeting, but someone organized a Zoom prayer meeting. And we had about 30 to 40 people who gathered on that call. And it was so powerful and so beautiful to see that. Not everybody even got to pray verbally, but we were there on that Zoom, agreeing together in prayer and storming the throne room of heaven for this little guy. And we've seen God move in his life. And we're going to keep praying for him, Mike and Helen. Well, maybe you're saying, okay, I, I pray, but still I just wonder what difference does it make? I've just seen so many unanswered prayers. I have things I've prayed for years for, and God doesn't seem to come through. What good does prayer really do, including just praying with other people? Well, one of the other things we see in this passage is that they pray acknowledging God as sovereign. Look again at Acts, excuse me, at uh, verse 24. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So they acknowledge God as the sovereign Lord and the creator. In verses 25 and 26, they say, You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant. So in a way of saying what it means that scripture was inspired, they say, God, you spoke and this happened. And they pray scripture. Perhaps you watched a pastoral short video I did a couple months ago where I tried to give a short teaching on what it means to pray Scripture. Well, here we get a model of this. They are praying Psalm 2. And they're saying to God, who is sovereign, this does not take you by surprise. And because you have spoken this in your word, this doesn't take us by surprise. Because what David said in Psalm 2 is now coming true in the greater David the son of David. Verses 27 and 28, take a look at that. They say, indeed it happened. It says, they did, that's Herod, Pontius Pilate, this whole group of people that were responsible for putting Jesus to death. Look at what it says in verse 28. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. That is a staggering verse. Now, when it comes to exactly how this works, I don't exactly know. But what we see happening at the same time, what is true at the same time, is that they did it, they were responsible, and yet this was part of God's plan. Well, in fact, what's happening is that they are echoing what happened back in Exodus when Pharaoh raised himself up against God's people. It is true at the same time that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Both were true at the same time. Pharaoh was responsible, and yet it was part of God's plan to rescue his people out of slavery. When Peter is preaching in chapter 2 of Acts at Pentecost, he tells them that it was God's plan. They say He says that you put him to death. But it was part of God's plan and foreknowledge. Church, I don't have a great explanation for how this works. We're not told how it works. But these believers in Acts acknowledge that this is so. This is easily one of those examples where we can say truly, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. So I can't explain how this works, but there is a power in what they pray here when they say God, this happened, and it was your plan. So maybe you're saying, yes, I I acknowledge God's sovereignty. That makes sense from the word, but what is prayer really? How does it work? And that leads us to our next insight, where they pray audacious prayers. They pray audacious prayers. And I love the definition of prayer from John Anwu Chekwa who says that prayer is calling on God to come through on his promises. Early in Genesis chapter 4, it says people begin to call upon the name 
of the Lord. And in one sense, they are calling on God's promises because back after the fall to Eve, God promised that the seed from her, the seed of the woman from Eve would be raised up to crush the head of the serpent. So throughout scripture, throughout redemptive history, we see people calling upon God, calling upon the name of the Lord to come through on his promises. I also love the definition where it says that God ordains that he works through the prayers of his people. So it's just part of his plan, sisters and brothers, that he works through our prayers. Now he's not just sitting around waiting, taking a nap until we say exactly the right words and somehow that activates him like that genie. But no, he wills that we pray, that we partner with him. So what a privilege it is to pray. You look at there in verse 29. They say, enable your servants. In the midst of their threats, God, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. What an audacious prayer. The whole reason that Peter and John were in trouble, which is the backdrop to this story, is because after they'd healed someone in the name of Jesus, they began to preach. Well, the religious leaders hated that. They they hated this name, Jesus. Well, here they are saying, God, even though this just happened and we were in big trouble, enable us to keep speaking with boldness. And then they say, verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal. Keep healing, Lord, to bring glory to your name and so that we can keep speaking with boldness. Well, then you may say, all right, I'll pray audacious prayers. I get that. But then what role do I still have to play? And that's the fourth insight that this text gives us. We pray and then act. That's what the believers did here. They pray and then they act. Look at verse 31. It says that they spoke the word of God boldly. After they prayed, the place was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they spoke the word of God boldly. I love what one pastor scholar says. When he says that we are to act the miracle. Yes, we pray for God to do miracles. Stretch out your hand, God, and do miracles. You can do the supernatural. We still believe that you can do the impossible. But there are times in our life where we pray for stuff and we wonder, God, well, what's my role? And I love what this guy says. He just says that we need to act the miracle. That's what they do here. They're praying for God to work in them to have boldness. And then when the time is right, they step out and they act. They speak boldly. So, church, as we come into this year, as we seek to become a praying church, there's a couple things I think we need to do to address the fact that we are not yet a praying church. And the first one is to understand better what prayer is. So I want to encourage you to keep listening to this series, to listen well. And even as you listen, to be praying for God to help you focus and to really learn. And then consider coming to that prayer seminar where you can learn not just by hearing, but by praying, by doing. We're going to have an experiential prayer seminar. Then the other one is for you to take action. And so the action step that I want to put before you is very practical, LVC. We have a bi-weekly prayer meeting. We actually made it bi-weekly during the pandemic to say, God, we just got to keep, we got we to start praying more, actually. Before the pandemic, it's been a monthly prayer meeting uh, for as long as I've been around, for at least four years. But we made it bi-weekly. And the reality is, as I told you, that we get about 2% of LVC adults at this prayer meeting. And so what I want to do, church, is, is challenge you to consider making six of those prayer meetings over the course of the year. So there's 24 total. But for each of us to consider and to plan, like that pastor said, that we don't pray because we don't plan to pray. So I wanna put before you, what do you need to do to plan to be part of six LVC family prayer meetings? So consider this. On average, a person has 150 non-sleeping, non-working, non-eating hours. That's a typical month, 150 hours. 
So over the course of six months, that's 900 non-sleeping, non-working, non-eating hours. I wanna challenge you to set aside six of those 900 hours to say, I'm gonna do what it takes to gather virtually on Zoom at 10 a.m. with brothers and sisters. And church, if we, if each one of us did that, if my calculations are correct, we would have in each prayer meeting 75 people. That would be an amazing problem to have. Our prayer leaders, our prayer facilitators would have to figure out how do we do a corporate prayer meeting on Zoom with 75 people? But I think it would be a beautiful problem. You may not get to pray verbally. Not everyone would get to in, the, in that hour. But what a, what a beautiful thing as we gather together to say amen, to agree together in prayer as we're hearing people pray out, whether it's praying about the country, praying about the pandemic, praying for nurses and doctors and all these other medical workers, praying for our kids, praying for school children, praying for peace in Kenya. Church, we need to be praying. We need to go after God this year where we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen with the vaccine. I mean, just as of a couple weeks ago, there was already a mutation in England. This virus is crazy. And by God's grace, we're going to see something different in 2021. I am hoping and believing. But we need to go after God in prayer. And look, maybe you're Zoomed out. As you think about another year of Zoom, you may break out in hives. But look, if Zoom fatigue is what's keeping us from praying, even doing six prayer meetings over the course of the year, can I just challenge you as one of your pastors, challenge you in love? Can you push past Zoom fatigue? And if we say, look, I just, it's hard to get on a prayer meeting. It's even hard to get on a home group because I'm just on Zoom calls all day. I understand. But look, is it possible? Can I tell you this in love and ask you this in love? Is it possible that our unwillingness to, to join in on Zoom with brothers and sisters in Christ in prayer and saying, God, I'm just not sure if it's doing much good. Does it speak to what we really believe about prayer? Look, there are times where I look at that prayer meeting on my calendar and it feels like just another thing to do. And you may say, Jeremy, I mean, you're a pastor. This is part of your role. And indeed, I do feel the responsibility. And yet, it's never failed. Every single time I'm in that prayer meeting or I'm in my home group. After it's done, I am so glad I went. I'm so glad I was a part of it. I walk away encouraged. And if you're struggling with the idea, and maybe you've experienced joining in with something and think, ah, I just, I'm not sure if that was worth my time. You're not alone, I guarantee you. But can I encourage you to seek the Lord's face and say, God, help me engage. Help me push past whatever fatigue I have to do a small part, to join in with my church family, to pray. Because look, on a, on a positive note, let me cast a vision for you. Think about 2022 or 2028 or 2031, 10 years from now. I would still love to be LVC's lead pastor. And look, what if we look back as a church at 2021 and say, you know what? Good stuff has been happening throughout the life of LVC, but something happened in 2021. As we really went after the presence of God and just sought his face during another pandemic year, we began to see God do things that we could not have predicted. Church, he's going to continue to be faithful. And he is not dependent upon our prayers, and yet he calls us to partner with him. So let's do that this year. Let us go after him and his presence and seeking his face for all these things that we want to see happen. And may one day we look back at this year and say, that was the year. That was the year where something happened. Church, may it be so. Let's pray. Oh God, I come before you and I'm seeking your face right now to take these feeble words 
God, and to drive them home in each heart. Lord, may it start with me. Lord, to not come before your presence, to not come to any prayer event out of a feeling of guilt, but Lord, would you change my heart? Would you change each heart to give us an appetite for more of you? God, would you increase our faith? Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. Give us the faith to believe, Lord, that you do answer prayer, that you work through the prayers of your people. So God, would you make us as a church family? Would you make us a praying church? God, we need you this year. We have just come off of such a difficult year. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Lord, stretch out your hand, even through these screens. Lord, as I reach out towards them, stretch out your hand and do amazing things in us and through us as individuals, as families, as households, and as a church. Lord, then help us to step out, to step up and to act and to keep trusting you for what you are going to do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. Happy New Year. Thank you.